Ladies and gentlemen, Jodev's Professional Education Forum is organizing the PK Shivdev oration for the first time. Many of you perhaps know that P.K. Shivadev was born in the year 1904. He was a prolific Malayalam writer. He earned his name and fame through his 300 odd short stories, 31 novels, several dramas, numerous plays, and an autobiography. He can be referred to as the first writer to usher in the renaissance of Malayalam literature by writing the novel Odeil Nunna from the gutter in 1942. His works exhibited a sustained concern for the downtrodden and the poor, and his works throbbed with a concern for mankind. He was decorated with national and uh, state awards for literature. They was not just a writer alone, he was a social reformer, a trade unionist, a speaker par excellence. Unfortunately, he became a severe chronic diabetic and succumbed to the savages of the disease in the year 1983. Jodhidev Keshavdev, the one and only son, then a 16-year-old child, stood beside his father's bed, feeding him, nursing him, and often administering the multi-dose of insulin. Jyotidev today is a renowned diabetologist and members of the medical profession may perhaps know him better than I do. The PK Shivadev oration is entitled, What is the New? What is new in the management of diabetic nephropathy, including renal replacement therapies? And is delivered by Dr. George Abraham, professor of medicine and consultant nephrologist, Pondicherry Institute of Medical Science, and Madras Medical Mission Hospital, Chennai, the recipient of coveted International Distinguished Medal in Nephro Nephrology in 2003. Dr. George Abraham around here. Sorry, sorry. I cordially invite Dr. Chako Varghese, a leading nephrologist, consultant nephrologist, Professor of Medicine Academy of Medical Sciences, Trivandrum, to chair the session. And I request Dr. Georgi Abraham to the dais. Dear friends, a very good afternoon to all of you. I consider it as a great privilege and pleasure and honor to chair this very important oration in memory of Dr. Jyoti Dev's father, Mr. Kesav Dev. And already everything about Mr. Kesar Dev has been enumerated here. So I don't want to go into Mr. Kesar Dev's glorious moments in his life. Well, today, to deliver this oration, we have with us Dr. Georgi Abraham, an internationally recognized and respected nephrologist from Chennai, who is my very close friend. And whenever I think of Georgie, he is well known for two things. The first place when he came back from Canada, he popularized the CAPD, Chronic Ambulatory Peritoneal Dialysis Program for end-stage renal disease patients in India, which is catering now for more than 10,000 people in India. And in the second place, he started the MRCP PACES program in India for the fresh MBBS graduates. With these few words, may I request Dr. Georgi Abraham to deliver his oration on diabetic nephropathy, what is new in diabetic nephropathy, including renal replacement therapy. Dr. Georgi, please. Respected Chairperson Dr. Chakovari is my close friend, distinguished colleagues, good afternoon. At the outset, I want to thank Dr. Jyoti Dev and his team for this wonderful invitation. It's a matter of great pride, and I cherish this occasion to share more than three and a half decades of taking care of patients with kidney disease in five continents in the world. I was fortunate to work in different countries. And um, basically, you know, let me move on to the next one. P. K. Shavdev. 
you know, when I was studying in Marivanius College, both of us studied in 1966 to 68, and uh, well-known person. So I'm just going to have what is written about him. And uh, he was a novelist and social reformer of Kerala state, remembered for his speeches, autobiographies, novels, dramas, short stories, and films. First writer to usher in the renaissance in Malayalam literature. Wherever I go and speak, I try to speak in Malayalam because there is a tendency in Kerala that everywhere we speak in English, but we forget about our language, Malayalam, which we were taught. And a prolific writer, written novels, short stories, and plays which bring out the powerful social critics. So he has spread the knowledge. When you spread the knowledge, you see God in all. He portrayed that. And his son, Dr. Jodidev, and his wife, Sunita, they are incredibly fantastic role models because they are doing, you know, what, has, what is necessary for the country and for South Asia region. And I shall dwell on the following things. Diabetic kidney disease in India, mechanism of diabetic kidney disease, conservative management and renal replacement therapy. There is a lot of work going on both at the clinical level and at the basic research level to find out what can be done best to improve the diabetic kidney disease outcome and thereby to improve the quality of life and to save lives. We are all working, I have my colleagues, nephrologists sitting in this, and we are all working tirelessly to see that what the best could be done through communicating and connecting with each other in the country and in the South Asian region. This shows the Chronic Kidney Disease Registry of India, which we were all part uh, from a database of 63,000 people, and diabetic nephropathy was the diagnosis in 31% of the population. And as you can see that, the graph on the right-hand side, majority of the people were male and females were less. At the same time, the the monthly income of 41% of these chronic kidney disease patients were less than 5,000 rupees. So this addresses the question is, can we take care of our diabetic population and how do we take care of them so that we can either have no diabetic nephropathy and take care of them all through or if they develop diabetic kidney disease, what can we do? So this, just to jog your memory, this shows the glucose handling by the kidney. You can see that, you know, one kidney is shown there and glucose filtered every day is about 180 grams. Urinary glucose is about 0.5 grams per day and glucose reabsorption is about 179 grams per day. When you look at the nephron on the right hand side, the nephron has four components. You have a blood vessel, you have a glomerulus, you have tubules and you have interstitial. And when you look at the glucose reabsorption, you can see that on the graph on the right hand side, majority of the glucose is reabsorbed in the, in the proximal convoluted tube, sorry. Majority of the glucose is reabsorbed in the proximal convoluted tubule using glucose sodium transporters. You can see that the transporter two is the predominant one and less by the transporter one. So this has to be kept in mind when you deal with, even at the undergraduate level or at the postgraduate level, when you deal with diabetic kidney disease. So the next slide depicts some of this that, pre-diabetes as a precursor to diabetic kidney disease. You do diet and exercise. We already heard a, an excellent review of what is happening in Maldives, and I have also been to that country, and body weight or obesity is an issue. Diet and exercise, so that you know you can reduce the chronic hyperglycemia. Then you have SGLT2 and SGLT1, which reabsorb the glucose. And the next one is renin angiotensin system. So if you start blocking these, all these, you can reduce chronic hyperglycemia. You can reduce thereby the proximal tubular hypertrophy because we are going to block the, the SGLT2 and SGLT1. 
So proximal tubular reabsorption of sodium and glucose is reduced because we also know that one of the reasons for developing hypertension and complications of diabetes is increased reabsorption of sodium and glucose in the proximal tubule and thereby decrease sodium delivery to the macular densa and by RAS inhibition you can reduce the glomerular pressure and uh, thereby alter the hemodynamic in such a way so that you don't produce hyperfiltration. So this should be kept in mind as process Shashaya said it starts in the fetus. Fetus can only handle 110 milligram of glucose at the level and I don't know how far developed is the SGLT2 and SGLT1 in the fetus. We have no data about that. So as we move forward, the risk factors for diabetic kidney disease are non-modifiable because in Kidney International 2016 February, there is a study done by Jiang who looked at 3,991 people looking at the single nucleotide polymorphism and he identified two from a group of 25 in diabetic patients and he found that 19.7% of them had rapid decline in renal function and and those people had this particular nucleotide polymorphism and thereby what is rapid when the fall in the GFR is more than 1 ml per minute per month or fall in the GFR is more than 4%. So he said that okay there is there are two single nucleotide polymorphism which are important which was written as a review article in Kidney International. So the other thing is male sex as I already shown you in the Indian data and age at onset of diabetes, duration of diabetes diabetes, increasing age, family history of diabetes because we know that clusters of uh, diabetic kidney disease are in our country and there is a strong family history of diabetic and hypertension and insulin resistance. Modifiable as we said about our friend from uh, Maldives said, poor glycemic control, hypertension, lipid abnormalities, smoking, metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, low grade inflammation, endotoxins, advanced glycation end products, low intensity of physical activity and increased salt intake. So this is just to jog your memory. You can see that as it moves, you have five stages. You have the pre, the incipient diabetic nephropathy, the overt nephropathy and the end-stage renal disease. So as nephrologists, we may see these patients, as diabetologists also, you may see this patient at any of these stages in our country. So you have, as it is shown in the blue line, the fall in the GFR, and in the red line, the, the blue line shows the proteinuria, and in the red line shows the fall in GFR. So it takes years, but when are we seeing the first diabetic patient? Are we seeing him at stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four, or stage five kidney disease? It depends on when we are encountering that patient. So this just show you the mechanism of proteinuria. As I said, there are four compartments, the blood vessel, the glomerulus, the tubule, and interstitium. So podocyte is the one which retains the protein in the, in, the, in the blood. When there is podocyte injury, which is seen commonly in all sorts of glomerular disease, you will see proteinuria. So podocyte injury is one of the pretty early factors. And then you have tubular injury as the protein goes through the tubule. Then you have blood vessels affected because of the diabetic changes both afferent and efferent arterioles and as time goes on you will have interstitial injury. So can we do something about all these things? Can we protect the podocyte research is going on? Can we protect the tubule research is going on? Can we prevent the fibrosis in the interstitial research is going on? And can we do something to the blood vessels so that they don't get thick thickened? So this is what basically it is. So proteinuria, there is no biomarker for diabetic kidney disease because it is a podocyte which is leaking. So we are trying to find out a biomarker, but I am not sure whether we would be able to succeed in that. So finally what will happen is end-stage renal failure as shown in this and sclerosis kidney when you do a biopsy or when we see on the postmortem. Now when you look at the diabetic kidney disease, I want you to look at the right side. So you have normal urine albumin excretion, you go into microalbuminuria, you develop clinical proteinuria and ESRD. Do, does everybody go through that? No, the answer is not. Because there is a subset of patients in India and abroad who do not go through this. It is shown on the right hand side. They may go to NCA renal failure, a small subset without going through all these stages. So this should be kept in mind. Now the question is who are the people who do not have 
classical diabetic nephropathy. If there is a sudden increase in creatine, if while using ACA or ARB, the rise in creatine is more than 30%, an active urine sediment, sudden onset of nephrotic syndrome, and these are all indication if there is no retinopathy that I don't consider, because we know that it is low in the list that, you know, you have to see retinopathy in every diabetic nephropathy. So these are the people who would require probably an additional intervention by a nephrologist to see that, is there a core disease? Because we see that every day in my practice, we do biopsies right and right. One of the largest centers doing biopsies and biopsy data in our country, other than CMC Velour is ours. We do that. We see that every day. Patients with diabetic presenting with non-classical features, we do the biopsy and we encounter a lot of lesions either in the glomerulus or in the blood vessel or in the tubular interstitium, which are not due to diabetic nephropathy, which can probably be treated. Now, this is one misconcept among every physician's cardiologist, endocrinologist. Oh, I have my creatinine is only one milligram. It very clearly says that any, at any glomerular filtration rate, GFR on the x-axis, there is considerable variation in the measured serum creatinine in concentration as GFR decreases to, to zero to, to loss of all the kidney function to zero, serum creatinine increase in an exponential fashion, renting to double with each 50% decrease in GFR. So a one milligram of creatinine is not normal for every individual. Please take that in mind, because you may have significant kidney damage, functional damage with a one creatinine. So keep that in mind and use the estimated GFR. Now, this is the most important message I want to give you as any nephrologist. This cartoon shows the albuminuria and CKD stage. This is the platform on which we have to work. On the left, you have green, which is very low risk. You have yellow, moderate risk. You have orange, high risk, and red, very high risk. And when you look at A1, A2, and A3, normal, albuminuria, moderate increase, and severe increase. And when you look at the left-hand side, you see the stages of chronic kidney disease. So everything shown in red is very high risk. So depending, you need to stratify as a diabetologist or other physician, look at this and stratify the risk of the patient. Control of blood pressure, control of diabetes, no, alternative medicine intake, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, all other things have to be taken into consideration when you look at that. Now, recent changes in the perceptions, I want you to look at the, the uh, rectangular, which is green. Microalbuminuria, reversion in majority, higher levels more likely to progress to proteinuria. And when you come to common clinical phenotype of CKD in diabetes, progressive decrease in GFR without significant microalbuminuria in a subset. And the next one is CKD uncommon at younger ages. No, the CKD commoner at earlier age in type 2 diabetes. These are the things I want you to keep in mind. So when you move forward, annual transition rates through stages of albuminuria in patients with type 2 diabetes. If you have no diabetes, on the right hand side you have the death, and in between you have uh, the microalbuminuria. So when you look at that, no nephropathy, the death rate is 1.4%, probably cardiovascular disease. As no nephropathy progress in 2% microalbuminuria, and the death rate increases to about 3%. And from microalbuminuria to macroalbuminuria, it is about 2.8% per year. The death rate increases to 4.6%. And when you go to a decrease in GFR with an increase in plasma creatinine, the death rate is 19.2. And I want you to look at the left hand side, what are the reversible factors? Not every diabetic, the kidney disease is due to diabetes. There could be papillary necrosis producing an obstruction. There could be prostatic hypertrophy producing an obstruction or a neuropathic bladder producing an obstruction. It could be an Ayurvedic drug which is producing an obstruction or it could be non steroidal So you have to look at the reversible factors and also look at the anemia. You know, anemia, you need oxygen to the kidney. Kidney is one organ which needs oxygen to do everything, especially the tubular function. So if you are sick, significant anemia, you may have an issue with that. So reversible factors should always be looked at when you are dealing with a diabetic kidney disease. So this shows, if, if you look at that, the level of kidney function as a risk factor for ACS cardio, we heard about uh, uh, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. As the GFR falls on the left hand side, you can see that there is an increase in cardiovascular mortality and the GFR is normal.
Now, this is something, you know, I just, I am going to discuss with you, share with you all our data, published and unpublished, because that's important for India to know that. So, in our uh, CCU, we had looked at uh, the cardiorenal syndrome, and we had total number of patients admitted with foreign ancestry. Diabetics were 278. Total number with AKA was 123. Among them, 90 were diabetics, and the mortality rate in cardiorenal syndrome was 31. All the patients who died were diabetic. So this very clearly shows you that in a patient who comes with cardiorenal syndrome, majority of them are diabetics, and they die because they have cardiac failure, they have arrhythmia, they have so many things you know, in common. And they may be also a subset of patients we have lost because of severe hyperkalemia, metabolic acidosis, those who were taking metformin, and also hyperkalemia because they are both on RAS inhibitors and aldosterone inhibitors. So this is something I just want you to, you have a CKD patient there, primary care provider, and he moves into the center. And he is being taken by a kidney specialist, a diabetic educator, a pharmacist, because you have to adjust the dosage of medications, and also advanced practitioner. Unfortunately, we don't have social workers except with uh, Dr. Jyoti Dev, and a skilled dietitian is very important. In any nephrology unit, we have a society now in our country looking at uh, nephronutrition. A skilled dietitian will give you the proper advice. It is not the nephrologist who is going to give the advice to the patient. So let's move, what is diet and lifestyle therapy for diabetic? Dietary protein intake is shown here, fat intake is shown here, saturated fat, and depending upon the stages it is given there. Stage one and two, stage three and four, what are the phosphorus uh, intake and about the sodium and potassium intake? Salt intake, sodium should not exceed 2.5 grams. Now, this is a, this I have taken it from Nihal Thomas textbook of diabetes. It is a busy slide, but it shows you that at the end of the day, whether you have a normal GFR, this is the one which I showed the earlier cartoon with green, yellow, red, and risk. So normal GFR and decreasing GFR, and what should be the drug? Because we have only two drugs now. One is blood pressure control, ACE inhibitor, or ARB. One hasn't been shown to be uh, superior to the other. The, on the other side, you have to also take care of the diet, and depending upon the GFR, you have to take care of the patients. And DPP-4 inhibitors and ARBs protect the kidney by different mechanisms. Now, this is the study. Now, you have to look at two studies, uh, a court study, and the advanced study. The ACCORD study showed that you cannot improve the patient survival, whereas the advanced study showed that you can improve the patient survival. So where do we stand? So we don't have <coughs> convincing data, you know, whether strict diabetic control will prevent uh, patients from developing any severe renal failure and die. Uh, that's what uh, the ACCORD study said, and the advanced study said that definitely yes. So when you look at that, you see the, the, this study shows that probably intensive glucose control may help you. And the next one is the Indian data, which shows that 41% of the patients do not follow up with diabetes within a year. They go from stage one to stage two to stage three to stage five, and they come with pulmonary edema and myocardial infarction and heart failure. We have to take care of them. And when you go, and this is a very important, how to use the medications in diabetic control. You have seen the, the, the half moon there, what should be the hemoglobin A1C, and also you have seen the blood pressure control. Now we have the sprint study which came in, where they used the oscillometer in a closed room checking the blood pressure by a nurse, where they said that 120 by 80. Whereas when you use the mercury, you see that the blood pressure is little high. So I use both in my clinic, and I will write oscillometer, and I will write mercury. Mercury will show a higher blood pressure. So the disadvantage of the sprint study was they were using oscillometer in the patient. So, but I feel that, you know, no patient should have a systolic blood pressure more than 130 and a diastolic blood pressure of more than 80 in a diabetic with kidney disease. Now, when we go to the, this is the latest, uh, empagliflin, it very clearly shows that empagliflin as may have a beneficial effect in slowing down the progression of kidney disease as shown by the placebo and empagliflin. Now, let me move on to the la latter part, modalities of renal replacement therapy. We talked about everything what we can do in a diabetic kidney disease. Once they reach end stage, uh, stage five chronic kidney disease with a GFR less than 15 ml per minute, you have to choose. Are we going to save the life of the patient, say that go and die? Or we have to choose the therapy as either hemodialysis or home peritoneal dialysis. 
Now, the, both has its advantages and disadvantages. But the best treatment is a renal transplantation. In our country, now people have started doing kidney pancreas transplantation. I don't have database on, database on that. But better survival and quality of life, there is 73% reduced risk of death post-transplant compared with cohort in the waiting list. So when you look at the hemoglobin A1C, I want you to just look at that. It is shown for a normal person without uh, diabetic patients without CKD and the diabetic patients on dialysis. So don't try to do over control the bl blood sugar looking at a hemoglobin A1C because they will go into hypoglycemia. So this curve very clearly shows that in a patient with chronic kidney disease, the target could be somewhere eight, but those patients without uh, kidney disease, you should have a lower target as we were hearing uh, all through this morning. <clears throat> the regarding the okay, transplant provides the, this graph merely shows that when you look at the, the, the straight line and the dotted lines, that is dialysis and the other one is transplant. Transplant provides the best quality of life in a selected diabetic with diabetic and say kidney failure. Now this is peritoneal dialysis. This is our data published from Sanjay Gandhi Institute. When you look at the left hand side, the graph, they haven't looked at the confounders. On the right hand side, they have looked at the confounders between diabetics on peritoneal dialysis and uh, the non-diabetics on peritoneal dialysis. And at the end of 40 months, the survival is almost same between diabetics and non-diabetics. Now let me show you this data. This is the one which we published in Oxford Journal. It's another article coming here on a sub-analysis. When you looked at nearly what were the cohort number 897, diabetics were 335, non-diabetics were 565. There is no other data in this country rather than this data. Large data from five centuries. We see that non-diabetics, hemodialysis, we haven't stratified them into rich people uh, and middle-income um, uh, middle group and low-income group. But we did that in the current article which is coming out. So non-diabetic at the end of six years, the hemodialysis survival is about 28.6% and diabetics a dismal 16.6%. So do you want this or you want a transplant? That's the best treatment. So the challenges of transplantation, pre-transplant, we are seeing a lot of older population, life expectancy we have to look at, social aspects we have to look at, comorbidities we have to look at, cardiovascular disease, peripheral vascular disease, increased perioperative morbidity and mortality, infections, because if you look at, even though Western countries, American data, they all died of cardiac failure. In our country, especially in the middle class and lower class transplant patients, the major cause of death is infection. So you have to look at infections, including UTI, even the VIPs, you know, who have been transplanted on a biopsy, I have seen tuberculous granuloma in the kidney. So you have to be very careful about that. And obesity and metabolic syndrome and post-transplant challenges are graft and patient survival compared to non-diabetic, cardiovascular events, major cause of death, uh, in 30% uh, of the functioning graphs and glycemic control, effects of immunosuppressive medication on glycemic control, obesity and hyperlipidemia. So this is a patient, this is a patient who we gave the best quality of life and uh, he had a CABG done in 1995 and now he is 73 years old. He was on maintenance hemodialysis 1996. He had his first renal transplant in 1997, 54 years old. Then he lived very well. And then in 2006, he develops again allograft failure. Should we transplant or shouldn't we transplant? He had few runs of dialysis. He was miserable on dialysis. He said, I don't want it. Better I die. So we took the challenge and he had a coronary arteriogram done, he had PCA with stenting done, he was again transplanted, and you can see that even in 73, he sent me a message yesterday, serum creatinine 0.8, adequate LV function, ejection fraction 65. So it very clearly shows that even in a diabetic patient, older age group, we can't undertake transplant and give them a successful quality of life. Now let me show you our data. This is the largest database in South Asia or comparing uh, 60 years and less and 60 years and more on transplantation. And we found that among the 162 uh, and, uh, patients, diabetic in the 
below, below 60 years were 45.36 and diabetics above 60 years were 59.1 and I will show you the survival graph. So this shows, you know, our honorable previous prime minister had uh, diabetes, he had microvascular complications, he underwent uh, PCIs and coronary and uh, revascular, we all know that it is in the newspaper. So this shows that there is no difference between those above the age of 60 and those below the age of 60, either in patient survival or graph survival at uh, five years. Now, pre-transplant glycemic control and post-transplant outcomes, coming to the last few slides. So, it very clearly shows that the pre-transplant glycemic control has an impact on the survival of the patient post-transplant. It very clearly shows that among a cohort of 2,872 patients. So, it tells you that you need to have glycemic control because so that you don't have many micro microvascular and microvascular complications in patients whom you are undertaking for transplant. So this very clearly shows that it is important and the red line points to an increased hazard ratio for complications and death. So this is a study which we have, which is coming out in the International Journal of Urology and Nephrology. We looked at the blood pressure of 506 post-transplant patients at the beginning and after one year. So we found that diabetics had a higher systolic blood pressure compared to non-diabetic. We all know that, you know, we need to control the blood pressure. So this is a risk factor. So we need to look at the blood pressure control, uh, the lifestyle changes, diabetic control, hyperlipidemia, and uh, propensity to infection, all in patients whom, who are diabetic, who we are taking for a transplantation. And this shows the biopsy of a patient. I want you to look at two things. One is the glomerulus is looking normal. The tubules are, but look at the blood vessels, uncontrolled blood pressure. See, there is a, hardly any lumen there. Interstitial uh, hyper, uh, uh, hyperplasia of the intima. So this shows that if you don't take care of the blood pressure, this blood vessel is not going to supply blood to the glomerulus and it will go ischemic. So it is mandatory that you have to control the blood pressure in your post-transplant patients. So my conclusion, thank you for listening. Diabetic kidney disease, a major cause of chronic kidney disease in India and South Asia. Awareness and early detection leads to risk reduction. Multidisciplinary team approach leads to better outcome. Renal transplantation is the best renal replacement therapy provided. There are no risk factors or co significant comorbidities. Thank you. And I submit this uh, oration to late my respected uh, PK Shodev and their family. Thank you very much, Dr. Georgi, for delivering the first PK Shodev oration.